Hello, I'm William Calvin, a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. The lectures in this Up From the Ape series are not really hour-long stand-up performances. They are videos designed for individuals to be able to pause and think about the current subject on the slide before proceeding. Try it out. This lecture is called The Fast Track to a Bigger Brain. It's the third in a series of lectures on human evolution. This one covering the period between about two and a half million years ago, the beginning of the Homo uh, genus, and agriculture about 12,000 years ago. In that period, the brain tripled in size, and this was likely made possible by a brush fire boom and bust in their meat supply that created an amplifying feedback loop. Last time I uh, took you through the uh, evolution from living in a forest to living in a woodland to doing well out on the treeless savanna. Uh, humans are unusual in that our bipedal uh, walk can be a walking stride. That's really a controlled fall forward where you catch yourself with a swinging leg. Then I discussed the first out of Africa journey of early Homo erectus 1.8 million years ago, journey spanning some 4,000 uh, 3,200 miles halfway to the North Pole, just from following the grazing herds from one water hole to the next. I then discussed how they acquired their meat, uh, amputating a hind limb from a lion kill and carrying it away leaving the lions to the belly, could have been the big payoff for the sharp edge. Uh, I discussed then the sharp edges needed for amputating hind limbs. Uh, the easiest way to make sharp edges is to throw one cobble-sized rock against a, a bigger one. Uh, they sometimes split in half neatly, like you see here on the left. Uh, and this method sufficed for about one and a half billion years until the uh, middle stage here, uh, where there's a pusher stick, an ostrich shell egg, uh, in this case, where you press the linear edge up against the linear edge in the rock, tap on it with a rock hammer, and shave off a sharp flake. It also creates a shop a sharp serrated edge all the way around. There are plenty of ostrich shells on the savanna. Uh, you can combine the techniques of splitting the rock and shaving off an edge, uh, which occurs another million years down the pike, uh, by having a cliff edge, basically. You can just shave off one blade after another going around the, uh, the top. Uh, there's also an evolution in uh, wooden tools. Uh, the first javelins we see in the archaeological record are in a German coal mine about 400,000 years ago, but they were surely using long poles the way uh, African children still do. Uh, to go out hunting for small mammals. In the case of taking a kill away from the lions, uh, long poles are handy for fending off the lions who uh, get impatient and want you to leave. But it's very easy to convert them into a spear if you just sand down the point on a convenient rock outcrop. Afternoon's work will give you a perfectly good spear. But stealing from lions has a limited payoff, really. Uh, at some point, do-it-yourself hunting will develop by passing the middleman. And the uh, easiest targets, if you wish to throw a spear, are when the animals come down to the water hole. Uh, the shoulder of Homo erectus shows signs of improvement for throwing spears at 1.9 million years. And this line of prey is the ideal target. 
if you miss the one you were aiming at, your spear will just hit its neighbor. It's a side of the barn throw. Really doesn't require that demand very much in the way of skill. So, from scavenging to spear thrower, you go through this stage of power scavenging that depends on sharp edges and long poles. Do it yourself hunting, uh, throwing pointed poles, and eventually weighted javelins. And then comes accurate throwing, the sort of thing that we normally think in terms of a single target, a single hunter uh, creeping up quietly and throwing from a distance. Uh, once you master this, uh, of course, the targets will stand a little bit further away from you the next time. And so it keeps selecting for better and better gets up planning. What I heard has never encountered two-legged hunters before. They are relatively easy prey, as you can slowly walk up to them and then throw. After being hunted a while, a herd becomes wary. Hunters move on to the next naive herd. But in what direction are they going? Well, if they're starting out from Africa going north in the Rift Valley, uh, they really cannot go backwards down the Rift Valley because back there are these depleted or wary herds. So they continue going forward north up the uh, rift itself to the Red Sea, up the Red Sea rift to the Dead Sea rift that goes up through Lebanon's Mecca Valley uh, to Turkey, and it's just uh, the country north of Turkey is Georgia. And that appears to have happened by 1.8 million years ago. Uh, to aim at a single animal rather than a cluster of animals, as I said, is a bit more difficult. Uh, but you can develop standards, sort of like the basketball free throw that you always do the same way each time out, sort of like dart throwing. Uh, but if the target is not at one of your practice locations, or if it's moving, uh, then you usually have to improvise. A muscle command sequence is not one of your standards. And feel it get set just right, and then you throw. So this get set planning is the time for improvisation. It's much more demanding. And there's no just throw again, throw again until you hit, because dinner runs away if you miss the first time. Uh, because a herd retreats sooner as subsequent hunters approach, the hunter's aim must keep getting better and better in order to throw from farther and farther away. Uh, in terms of how the brain is timing the muscle movements, uh, a simple model of it says that twice as far is eight times more difficult for the brain to get the right timing for the novel activation sequence. But there will always be a reward for getting better at throwing more meat per month. Okay, now we're up to the uh, more difficult part of the story, the fast track to the bigger brain. I've addressed a lot of what, where, when questions about human evolution, but today we focus on how and why. And why is just the evolutionary timescale version of how the physiological timescale within a English lifetime. We seek a process, one that transforms the ape-sized brain of the Australopithes into one 3.3 times larger. So what was the process that transforms? The great discovery made by Charles Darwin in 1837 was not that evolution occurred. In other words, that today's species had ancestor species in the past with fewer or simpler features. That notion was circulating among scientists when Darwin was born in 1809. His grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, had even written a rather poetical book about it. Poetry being a clever way of spreading scientific ideas to the general public. It was after all the age of the romantic poet William Blake, who said, to see the world in a grain of sand, 
and to see heaven in a wildflower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hands and eternity within the hour. I mean, where are the scientific poets of yesteryear? <laughs> but no one knew then how the crank was turned for the process which transformed the species into a new one. So let me define a process for you. A process is a little story, a little set of actions, about how you transform one thing into a different thing and what turns the crank. And I was the process of baking blades I've discussed, the process of uh, increasing approach distance I've discussed. Uh, the most better, better analogy, however, will probably be a recipe. A recipe decide, describes a standardized process for achieving a specific end product. It's not only just a list of ingredients, but it's a story about the order and manner in which they are combined, specifying the heat and the implements to be used and so on. Darwin discussed a mindless process for concentrating favorable genes, as we would say today, calling it natural selection, a contrast being made to the artificial selection practiced by mindful breeders. Natural selection is the process that serves to fit the species to its environment, sometimes making a new species along the way, sometimes just back and forth selection. That was the crank that Darwin inferred. He discovered the mindless process that underlies most of evolution. Let's call it the recipe for evolution. Many scientists have used traditional Darwinian thinking, that is to say, selective survival retains mutations that were more useful in surviving childhood. They've used this kind of usefulness reasoning to approach human brain enlargement. They have looked for useful behaviors that might be improved via selective survival. But suppose useful is backwards in this case that it was enlargement first, thus making added cortical space for a new behavior that might or might not prove useful someday for survival. My goal here is similar to Darwin's, for brain enlargement to show how the crank was steadily turned starting 2.3 million years ago, ending with agriculture, a recipe we need for three times bigger brains. Human exception has long appeared to be sort of some exception to this usual Darwinian way of doing things. In the 1860s, both Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace, who discovered natural selection independently, suspected that human evolution was not a good fit to natural selection in some ways. But then selective survival for usefulness was the only aspect they understood then. Here I'm going to show you an additional path, selective opportunity, uh, also known since the 1930s as another possibility, how selective survival yields more grandchildren via a kind of amplifying feedback. The amplifying feedback is what I've added to this story. The type of natural selection, this type, requires a special setup. It's not a general uh, across the board kind of thing like selection for usefulness. So this recipe brings together six ingredients. I'm going to work through them and then summarize for you the complete operation of the loop. Uh, the first ingredient one would never normally think of in this time in sense of brain enlargement it's about grazers as the meat supply. Ask you what limits grazer numbers uh, over the time course of climate changes. The original large herbivores ate both leaves and grass. Ecologists call them mixed feeders. But some specialized in leaves, we call them browsers. Uh, eat mostly grass and you become a grazer. 
essential are what you eat. The calcium in your bones reflects the calcium in your favorite food. Same for carbon atoms. Most carbon atoms have an atomic weight of 12, but some have two extra neutrons, making them carbon-14. It kicks out the extra neutrons sometime in the next 50,000 years. It's been very handy for dating organic materials. But if, you, if there's only one extra neutron, it's pretty stable. Uh, that's carbon-13. For some reason, the metabolic processes in grass favor carbon-13 a little. And so the bones of grass eaters have a little bit more carbon-13 than do grasses. So you are what you eat, and pre-human teeth preserve the, this isotope ratio of grass. Starting at about two and a half million years ago, we saw Australopithecus had this shifted uh, ratio for grass, implying they were sure eating a lot of grass compared to chimps. And it was probably not because they were baking bread or making soups. Grass in Africa has more carbon-13 than the leaves do, and thus the bones of grazers and their pre-human brothers are also rich in C13. Grazers evolved from mixed feeders in, West, in East Africa about 2.4 million years ago. This allowed brush fire booms to commence. Grazers have a population boom when brush fires create a temporary grassland, an auxiliary grassland to their usual. Browsers and mixed feeders do not boom. The burn scar diminishes resources for browsers. For mixed feeders, the burn scar was already part of their range. They were eating its leaves there, and now they switch to eating the grass there. It's not really an expansion of resources for them. But for the specialized grazers that cannot utilize leaves and brush in any large amount, the burn scar constitutes a range expansion. One expects a boom time over a decade. For those pre-humans able to acquire meat in large packages, Leaves are full of water, so browsers may not need to drink, not visit a water hole. But if you're specialized in grass, you really have to visit a water hole every other day, the ecologists tell us. Before 2.4 billion years ago in specialized grazers, water hole predation would have been unreliable. The evolution of grazers should have created a boom time for ambush predators, such as lions. The brain size increase goes like this. It brain size doesn't much change. It's a little bit uphill, but not much. Uh, from the chimpanzees through the Australopithecines. The brain enlargement really starts uphill at what appears to be 2.3 million years ago, right after grazers evolved at about 2.4, it's essentially simultaneously. There was a drop in brain size with the beginning of agriculture. As they started about 12,000 years ago, down to six, brain size dropped 10 to 17 percent. It's a matter of individuals becoming less robustly built, you know, bigger people having somewhat bigger brains. This isn't a regression in how the brain is organized. It's just a matter of the maintaining selection or keeping people really big and robust. Uh, faded as agriculture supplied more and more of their diet. Okay, now we're getting up to the second ingredient. 
Brush fires create temporary grasslands because a month after these fires, uh, there is enough new grass growing to attract in grazing animals. Here's a picture uh, two months after a brush fire that was set by the, pop, the um, wildfire the ecologists. Uh, these guys here are water bucks. So they're really a mixed feeder. They're not going to have a population boom because of this fire. Before they read the leaves in this patch of burned scars are now they switch to eat the new grass that's out. The brush returning several days, decades later, won't cut their numbers as they just go back to eating leaves. But suppose these guys were grazers instead. Before the fire, this patch is not in their territory. It's not part of their research space. But afterwards, we now get to what happens with boom and bust to the grazers. And this is going to be a dozen slides or more because I'm basically going to have to take you through all the, much of the standard genetics. And particularly the population demography. So here is the population pyramid, as it's called, that shows you death rates. Uh, this happens to be for Mexico, it looked different for US and Canada. Uh, but what you see here is that there aren't very many people left at age 80. Uh, but down here at the base, birth to four years, we see that Males on the left are, what, 7.9% of the population. And then over at the right side showing females, they're also another 7.9% of the population. So 15.8% of the total population is under four years of age. Uh, but then as time marches on here, if the, assuming the birth rates really will change, uh, what you see is that by age 20, we have a situation where about half of the population are immature below the line, and half the population is adult. Now, the other thing that you see from this, say, let's take the left side for males, you see that by age 20, half of the males are dead. Malnutrition, injury, infection, predation, all the, all the usual. This means that a mother has to have four children in order to get two that survive to become adults, you know, therefore being able to replace their parents in the population total. Producing more helps the population size to grow when resources expand. The extras are called the surplus to replacement offspring. And I suppose the more children you have, the more chances you have of, if a population expansion can occur, of them getting a bigger share of the gene pool. So let's discuss selective survival analysis for the traditional Darwinian argument. It's basically a sculpturing process. That's say you're creating a pattern by removing stuff. In this case, the patterns are the behavioral characteristics and the bone uh, size and length and so on. Natural selection, this mindless design, operates on the overproduction shaping the population to better cope with the local environment. The individual is better able to find sufficient food, avoid injury, escape predators, and fight off infection, are the ones that last long enough to become adults. So the next generation is enriched in genes that are useful for gains through childhood. And this repeats over and over, one generation after the next. You can make very small changes in one generation and still have it accumulate nicely. 
So it's going to be a tension. Uh, if where I focus on a single gene, now I won't specify what for, but um, basically this gene could be called allele A, and if a mutation comes and it comes along, we'll call that allele B. Question is, is when the mutated allele B might take over the market and retire allele A. Most survival of the fittest is directed at the young because they are the most of the population. Uh, youth is where the action is, at least for most of the evolutionary process. Now let's discuss expansion. Natural selection does not shift the gene pool market share solely by selective survival of childhood. The gene pool can also be shifted by selective reproductive success. An example is selective range expansion. There's fair literature on this. Uh, and you can see how it would work uh, because some of the surplus to uh, replacement uh, population of offspring uh, will now be able to grow up because of the range expansion. So your decreases malnutrition, death, deaths, and so on. All this is standard genetics, the, the Fisher wave of range expansion where mutations survive the fixation much better than in the main population that isn't uh, moving somewhere. So let's consider a grazer presented with a boom opportunity. It has a gene that has two alleles, the standard A and the mutated B. B is going to be blue in the next slide. A is the most common, but it has a mutated form, allele B, that is on its way up because of an interesting mechanism. Boom and bust adds a new twist to this. Uh, the expansion, of course, emphasizes the genes on the frontier. If they're any different from those in the main population, if it's not well mixed, uh, this can produce a founder effect. Uh, the new grassland will have the uh, genes that help you be in the right place at the right time to get the opportunity for extra surviving children with those genes. I'm not going to lead you through this derivation of why boom and bust is like the compounding of interest. Suffice it to say that a species range has boundaries. In the days before range fences, it's usually a matter of diminishing resources such as grass and water. But sometimes wind shift and deliver extra rain, expanding the range of the species. A population boom ensues. But who gets the extra offspring surviving the deterrent? It's the frontier type. The ones that normally would tend to cluster up at the frontier, they'd linger there longer in their circulation back and forth, uh, would be the ones that primarily get the expansion. Okay, now let's go through the fringe of brush and grassland. Over here on the left, we have pasture and uh, two types of uh, individuals in the species, the A's and the blue B's uh, circulating around. But as you see up in the fringes, the blues tend to linger a bit longer. There's A's up there too, but uh, the blues are going to, uh, to dominate. Now this grassland gets hit by a lightning strike and it causes a burn scar. And a month or two later, there's a lot of grass in the burn scar, but none of the animals have discovered it yet. There are some grassy pathways in the brush, but they don't happen to connect over. But these fellows that are exploring the fringe inlets uh, get a path that opens up, okay? And now those that happen to like being way back in the grass leads going back to the brush, those guys are the ones more likely to find their way in. Yeah, there'll be some type A's and so forth, but the ratio of A and B will be different in the burn scar than it is in the grassland. 
So it's a boom time not only for grazing animals, but for the hunters that follow grazing animals. So they, the ones that happen to like going into these brush finishes, uh, will also get a boom time that will make them, their population, after a couple of generations, uh, somewhat different from the main grassland. Okay. Now I'm going to describe the part that is amplifying feedback. After this, a couple of year, year, a uh, couple of decades of this uh, nice auxiliary grassland, comes the bust as the brush returns to it. And so the hunters have to follow the grazers back to the parent population. A selective expansion, that emphasizes B, coupled with this return migration, can quickly produce a substantial shift in the main population's allele proportions. What would otherwise take many millennia of selective survival operating on the fringe fraction of population. This applies even to the grazers predators, say for humans. Let's assume this is a gene that promotes seeking out shade, not just staying out in the midday sun, but a real um, preference for spending more hours than the others in the shade. Okay, so let's go through this now. Those with the uh, blue shade trait spend more time than the others in the shady fringe, and they are skimmed off as the path opens into the burn scar. So the burn scar population has shade. Now, here's decades later when brush takes over and starts squeezing this population back out. It squeezes out both the grazing animals and the grazers predators. So numerous shade bearing children and grandchildren now are following their meat supply back into the main grassland. The next, that changes the ratio between A and B in the main grassland a little bit. But it's that altered portion that is used in the next such brush fire boom and bust. So shades bark share keeps growing. And as in the compounding of interest, the next increment, the next boom, uh, produces an even bigger increment after its bust occurs. This is the standard setup for an exponential rise. It enriches the shade proportion used for the subsequent interest calculation, if you were, until shade completely takes over the market, becoming fixed. I mean, this being a portion, it can't go to infinity. It has to stop at one. OK, now let's discuss the physical setup for these boom and bust opportunities. So here's how rift valleys are created in geology. There are hot spots beneath the plants across the, the uh, Colorado Plateau is one of them. Uh, sorry, Phoenix uh, Flagstaff in north up to say Moab, Utah is such a blister. And at least in Africa, uh, sometimes you get two parallel cracks in the surface and the surface is expanding. Now, when you have two parallel cracks close enough, uh, they can allow the crust in between to drop down as a block into the deeper into the earth. They just remove the friction on the side that held it up. The archaeologists are very grateful for this because both walls of the Rift Valley have fossils exposed in them that would otherwise require an enormous deep trench to discover. And archaeologists have never had and still don't the money to do such things. Now, the Rift Valley is an excellent geometry for this amplifying feedback loop in grazers and their predators. Let me walk you through it here. Uh, 
there, the water that falls up here on the plateau uh, tends to drain through fairly quickly. There isn't much left to grow grass. Um, and it tends to sort of come out uh, on the walls of the rift, the escarpment here. Uh, sometimes there's waterfalls and springs, but uh, let's just look at this water hole uh, at the bottom. Now the bottom here has enough water in the uh, soil so that brush can survive the dry season. Okay, so we have a border here now between grass growing area and brush. Just set up by the geology. You, you've got to have water holes for kind of grazing animals. So you can have grass up here on the plateau, but if there's no water source up there, it's not going to be utilized, except by the mixed feeders or the browsers. Okay, so now lightning strikes in the bottom. You get a burn scar, and the path eventually opens up, giving this boom time opportunity to the grazing animals and their predators. Okay. So the Rift Valley is kind of handy uh, for doing this in a way that many other physical situations are not. So here's just a little reminder that brain enlargement seems to have begun at about the same time as grazers. And the brush fire feedback loops are one of the candidates for the ramp up. But how might all this enlarge the brain? Well, that's been fun to discover this last year. Now I have to lead you through a fourth ingredient, which is sort of just mating. I mean, so far in conventional evolutionary theory, this is a recipe for making frontier virtues. So it's on the frontier of the species range, you get the expansion opportunity, more common in the general population. But what comes next is a new process that emerges from this out. Traits can hitchhike. I will use the case of a sort of mating. Those who hang out in the shade more than others tend to mate with those that prefer shade for some reason, not necessarily the same reason. All right, so let's go through a sort of mate. Uh, it's defined as the reproductive pairing of individuals that have more traits in common than when mate selection is random. It sorts like artificial selection does really, but without a breeder doing selection. Mate selection in humans is you know, most intense in the college years. Uh, the mating pool is usually high school friends and one's neighbors and so on. You know, it's sort of local, sometimes regional is your pool of choices. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of choice being broadened or narrowed just by the way the culture First example, in Israel, there's a draft. It's called national service. Uh, and both men and women are in the army after high school. Then they do college or vocational training a few years later. The pool of mate choices is thereby widened by mixing ethnically and educationally with these high school graduates. It becomes a melting pot that prevents mating choice from operating the same way in the next generation because things mix again. Okay. Where both male and female can pass college entry requirements, the pool of choices is narrowed after high school rather than widened. College students have all been selected for such traits as sustained attention abstract thinking, versatility, being able to make quick decisions that are nonetheless pretty good. This means that the next generation will have a greater proportion of those traits. Since college educated parents tend to send their own offspring to college as well, 
This is quite unlike the Army's rescrambling of the mate choice pool. I mean, the odds of intermarriage between college graduates and high school graduates declined by 25% over a 50 year period in 1990. While spousal educational similarity, as it's called in the literature, is probably not the way the brain enlargement occurred in the past. There were two entry requirements. But these two extreme examples, Army and college, serve to remind us how associative mating works. Fifth ingredient, versatility concentrates in the brush and shade. OK, so we've gone through four ingredients, none of which have anything obvious about them that says bigger brain. But you know, in recipes, the finished product, say a pastry, doesn't look anything like you know, the flour, the butter, the egg, uh, it, or the bicarbonate, you might add, the baking soda. Uh, none of those things look anything like the finished pastry. We're talking here about transformative processes that make these things. And the first hint here is going to be the fifth ingredient. Versatility concentrates in the brushing shade. So there is a need for sun. You see these three cheetahs shading up here. Uh, this is one of the copses, the rocky outcrops on the uh, uh, savanna. I mean, our free human ancestors were probably acting the same way. You know, only mad dogs and Englishmen stay out in the midday suns. No coward sun. Give them a choice. Most shaded up on occasions throughout the day. The question is how many hours of shade, many or a few, and do some people do it more than others? Shows you that even Seattle style rain hats are perfectly good in Savannah. So there are grassy paths that lead back into the brush along this fringe. So this is grassland in the upper right here. And here's a couple of paths that these antelope are uh, starting to explore. They don't really like to explore them usually uh, because uh, predators can hide easily the way they can't out in the grass. But what I'm going to be looking for here are sort of proto-occupations that might keep free humans in the shade most of the time, not just the hours when it's too hot to be out in the open. Uh, the first uh, thing is that you've got to protect infants from overheating. I mean, if it's 100 degrees out there, infants are going to overheat if left to themselves. They just don't have enough surface area to sweat on uh, to bring it down. So they really have to be held against the mother's skin so that her evaporative cooling keeps the infant cool as well. I mean, we normally think of this the other way, that mother's keeping the infant warm because it's cold outside. Uh, but it works the opposite way, too. If there's tendency for the infant to overheat, uh, then holding it against skin uh, of a, an adult uh, will do the job quite nicely. So if mother needs to park an infant on the ground in order to work with both hands for something, she needs to stay in the shade. Also, there are tasks that use both hands, which require long periods of close attention, thus done in the shade. For example, creating the sharp edges we talked about last time. Uh, food preparation that must have started back about two million years ago. Uh, pounding, soaking, and of course, cooking. Uh, some people think the cookie started about 1.8 million years ago. And uh, fire starting. Uh, the ability to get the fire going requires often a lot of time and concentration. OK, those are some of the reasons that some people will spend more time in the shade than others. 
Now the question is, how does the surrogate mating uh, affect all this? And it's going to show that there is a new process here that I've identified, which I call trait hitchhiking. That allows things like bringing the large one to sort of a free escalator ride up. It en enabling that boom and bust feedback loop to extend versatility and via that enlarge the brain. So by hanging out in the catchment zone, the brush fringe for, for the boom of a major food source, trait hitchhiking is enabled for traits that tend to concentrate there, often for traits other than predation, say seeking shade. So some hang out in the brush adjacent to a grassland more than others do. But that means associative mating occurs among those practicing tool making, food preparation, fire starting. That is to say, mating among the more versatile in the population, sort of like college. The bull in the meat supply can enhance the shade related traits in predators. The boom and its feedback loop would then amplify its traits in the main population once the bust occurs and they are led back. Because brush fires are so frequent, even weak hitchhiking traits can be enhanced. Uh, during dry season, there are lots of lightning strikes. And usually the burn scars are maybe no more than three or two, a little area around it perhaps, but some of them really get going and involve a great many, uh, a great deal of area, a whole hillside and such. Because brain size is strongly heritable, by which I mean uh, easily passed from parents to offspring, this, uh, two big brain parents tend to have uh, more big brain offspring than usual. Bootstrapping to a new normal via associative mating can be done by the more versatile hanging out in the catchment zone. Versatility, however, tends to need a bigger brain. Not always, but uh, you now have the possibility that the next generation will have a somewhat bigger brain. And what is it going to do with it? It's new. So this is why you may have a patch of new cortical space that's filled in by trial specializations, some of which are useful, some not. So let me show you the, the case for vision. Uh, back when I, look, when I look at my textbooks from 50 some years ago, uh, I would see that there are two maps in the brain, in the cerebral cortex of the visual. Uh, they were called V1 and V2. They were very right in the back of the brain. Uh, the picture that I'm gonna be showing you here on the left is taking the cortical surface and in the computer, uh, sort of inflating the cortical surface to be a two-dimensional map that we can read. So there's a lot of cortex hidden down in the folds of the brain here. And if we, are, I'm rotating it to sort of show you the brain folds. So there's temporal lobes sticking out on both of them. So the uh, Two visual areas were right in the very back. You can see orange there, which is V2. And uh, I'll show you here. Um, if we look at the half brain from the midline, and there's the corpus callosum, you can see there. But there's this whole stack of maps. Each one of them goes from basically the nose out to the periphery and from the top to the bottom. And so it's just one map after another, but the cells in them behave somewhat differently. They're all organized topographically uh, to match up with the outside world. But uh, they start doing different things. So as of last year, there were 
23 additional maps uh, about the size of a postage stamp or bigger. And actually, there are even more than that. Some of them are no larger than a pinhead, just a millimeter or so. So they're just reusing the genetic instructions for ordering the map out of this, uh, the various axons come in. But then they specialize. So you may, one of these areas is specialized for movement in the visual field. Another one is specialized for the features of faces, reading distinguishing individuals that way, uh, and reading facial expressions. The um, other side of the brain has a similar uh, arrangement, not entirely, but uh, pretty close. The importance of all this for explaining brain enlargement is with extra space like this, there's no need to keep proving the worth of a slightly bigger brain via selective survival. It's just sort of arriving automatically because of the assumption of mating in the context of a boom and bust system. It also means that one of the main ways that people have thought about for selective survival uh, enlarging the brain is this part of some sort of evolutionary arms race. Uh, you can see in beetles, you know, more and more armor and so on. And, but, uh, so this kind of boom and bust associative mating argument uh, does uh, get us out of the ordinary way of thinking. And in that we normally speak of selection pressure, changing things. But this current aspect of natural selection seems better able to account for rapid niche expansion, though expensive. You also enhance detrimental traits that tend to concentrate in the brush, say myopia, which is also strongly heritable. Okay, now we've got the ingredients on. Let's go back and discuss our original problem, which is why is the brain enlarged three times and then stop? So now I'm going to switch to function and ask of all the important things the brain is doing, um, what might uh, some interesting consequences be? Uh, there's several cortexes involved, as is some of the subcortical areas, in creating muscle command sequences that not only once you use for walking, which the spinal cord pretty much does, uh, but for arm movements of the various sorts that we use. Um, and if it's a novel movement, I mean, one you haven't done before, it's not part of your standard set. Um, Cortex is particularly involved. So it's easy to man that for the things that require get set planning, so you've got to think of how to do it for something that's not a standard. Um, movements in particular that are too quick for sensory corrections to guide them. Often, if you just do novel movement slow, if you're doing it a bit wrong, you'll get feedback. You know, it comes in from your arm to the brain back, commands come back out to correct it. But if the action is like a dart throw, uh, the latency of the information coming back in and going back out to correct it, that uh, reaction time loop uh, is about one eighth of a second for arm movements. The dart throw takes one eighth of a second. So from the very beginning of the movement, feedback, just uh, sensory information doesn't get there soon enough. So this means you have to have the perfect plan before you start to move. Now with set pieces like dark throws, um, you may just be able to memorize things, uh, but hunting involves unique opportunities. The prey is not at one of your standard uh, locations. They may be moving and so on. 
The, there are various ballistic movements, just sort of ones that can't be guided uh, by sensory feedback. Throwing, hammering, clubbing, kicking, spitting, and speech might all utilize a workspace in the brain for these novel ballistic movements. There's just starting to be some information coming in about, I mean, we talk of working memory for sensations coming in, but there's also a now identified for planned movements going back out that there is a cortical uh, working memory. But what this means, if they all utilize this novel workspace that for ballistic movements, um, as you specialize more and more, I mean, there were 10 areas will tend to sort of uh, develop uh, specializations as uh, you won't be able to use the area for hammering. It might take root in this flexible workspace and perhaps at the expense of losing some of the working memory space for planning a throw thereby decreasing the throwing accuracy. Okay, hold that idea. But since there is a considerable spread in brain size within a given generation, 10 or 15%, those individuals with a brain sufficiently larger than the current average will possess, possess the original average amount of flexible workspace, despite their space commitment to the new hammering specialization. So this larger than average is serving as a pre-adaptation, as it's called, making it easier to map yet another neocortical innovation in those individuals of the current generation with sufficiently larger brains. Now I want to discuss the migration situation and get into the question of how does geography affect this argument about bigger brains? First of all, the feedback loop itself really depends upon having a brush area that can develop secondary grassland next to a grassland that isn't too big because then the change in genes per cycle will be very small. So the Rift Valley path that goes up through East Africa to the Red Sea, then up to the Dead Sea at Sinai, then on north to the 42 degree north plate boundary at Dominici in Georgia, this would have allowed feedback loops all along that path to repeatedly enrich migrants with brush relevant alleles in route. Now, the feedback loop works best, as I said, if the main population is kept small. In other words, the water for the grazers is only found in the valley, not in the plateau. So it's really just a population that stays within a day of the, uh, the water supply uh, that's being affected. Less effective loops. Well, the predictions of this theory is that less effective loops may have influenced the non-ancestral versions of Homo, the genus Homo, the Neanderthals, Asian Homo erectus, as they immigrated into environments where there were fewer suitable sites for the feedback loop. So you really expect slower brain enlargement when uh, the uh, prehumans are spreading into European forests or they're spreading into the steppes of Central Asia where the uh, parent grassland is enormous compared to the size of any little uh, auxiliary grassland that might happen on the fringes. All right, let's come back to the data now on brain cells. This plot is showing 175 fossil skulls from which 
that are good enough for us to estimate brine size. It is a collection created over nearly 160 years, represents an enormous effort of people, you know, clearing away things in the hot sun, in dusty environments. Okay, let's look at brain size. All right, now the first time here, let's back up a sec. Um, what you see here is the line, the piecewise linear line that people have been fitting to this data. That is to say, starting about a half million years ago, things were rising about twice as fast as they were before. Okay. Uh, however, as I analyzed, reanalyzed all this data in the literature during the past year, I discovered some interesting things. The correct line would be this blue one because you have to get rid of the non-ancestors, Neanderthals and Asian homo. And this, in the next slide, shows you how it works. Here on the left, I'm plotting only ancestors, Homo sapiens and Homo sapiens ancestors. Okay, so here's Homo erectus back here in Africa, uh, mostly. Uh, and at about 0.8 million years ago, uh, it changes into the uh, species uh, Homo heidelbergensis, those purple spots. And then Homo sapiens after uh, 200,000 years ago, those blue dots. Okay. But you see on the right are the ones in gray that we left out of the plot. So what you see here, first of all, there's the same uh, Homo erectus that we had in the other plot, but at eight tenths of a million years, uh, we no longer are plotting the ancestors we had, but rather the ones that took a different path. So here's that line that we have from just copy it over from the left one. And what you see is there's the brain of Asian Homo erectus, that they really enlarged much more slowly than our ancestors. So here's a gap of 400,000 years that before um, they catch up. And as I showed you before, if you have too much grassland it dilutes the loop increment. So the steps of Central Asia uh, may have well slowed down uh, brain evolution. And here's Neanderthal. Neanderthals were also slowed, particularly if you uh, don't consider these really big ones. Really big ones are a little problem, and that is there's hybridization. There's uh, mixing crossbreeding between Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis uh, during the most recent period before the Neanderthals disappear 40,000 years ago. Now, Neanderthals are slowed for a different reason. That is to say, the forests in Europe mean there's not all that much grassland and not all that much brush. There's just you just can't continue the looping that went on that got started down in Africa, but uh, your pop, if your population does increase in brain size, it may just be because of a continuing trickle coming in from Africa. But let's say once they get there, there's just not the setup to keep this mechanism going. Now a few words, and this is really for the people that already understand a bit about DNA to RNA to protein synthesis. Uh, and I'll, I'll be brief about it before I come back to the main story. 
The ramp up in brain size is linear. It isn't exponential, like you might expect. Uh, but the linear rise can be explained by the accumulation rate for these enlargement-related mutations over time. The way mutation works in this case is a neutron from uh, the sun, usually, or outer space, comes in, gets slowed down by the atmosphere, and manages to hit a ovum in the mother's body or the sperm production uh, predecessors in a male body. It manages to knock out a single DNA nucleotide. Okay, now if it came in faster than that, it just destroyed the whole thing and the whole thing would never reproduce itself. Uh, but if you make a very minor change, it will reproduce itself. Now, most of these uh, knocked out uh, nucleotides get reinserted properly by a gene repair mechanism that operates. However, it makes mistakes. And that's what results in a so-called SNP. It means single nucleotide polymorphism. Sometimes this results in coding for a different amino acid. Okay? So here, here's an RNA sequence that's going to be used in sequencing the amino acids to make a protein. So I'm just taking a sequence here. It's, it's a triplet of three of them that specifies the amino acid. And the next triplet of three specifies the next amino acid and so on. So the mutation I've shown here is just in the second one. Okay. Now, does that make any difference? Some of these triplets that are different still specify the same amino acid. Uh, there's only about 20 or so amino acids uh, possible here, but there's something like 64 uh, possibilities if you're doing triplets, each of which can be one of four. Okay. Now here is the table that shows you what amino acid you get. It could be valine, aniline, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, glycine here on the bottom. Okay. Well, what is the original sequence? C G C A. Well, here it is over here. That specifies alanine. As to a number of other combinations. Okay. And what's the mutated one? Well, it's over here, C G G A, and that specifies glycine. So we're now constructing a protein that's got one uh, amino acid block. Okay, that's how you get a allele that is actually functionally changed. Now, with just one wrong amino acid, the protein may fold up differently, changing its physiological properties in the functioning organism. Often, this slows or speeds up the developmental process. A uh, mutated recipe, as you know, might lengthen the time you bake it. Okay, or the uh, changed protein may make the process stronger or weaker. Okay, so they're like change it by using two eggs instead of one. So this is the kind of thing that's going on. And it really has, you have to make changes in do, probably dozens of different processes in this manner in order to get right enlargement. The feedback loop is important here in that it, most of these mutations, when they're relatively low number in the whole population, uh, just disappear, okay, just by chance fluctuations. Uh, but the feedback loop can make them more and more and more numerous and drive them fixation pretty quickly, um, maybe on the order of a thousand years. So you might ask, as people recently have, how many mutations occur in the time between one generation and the next? Turns out that each baby born has about 60 SNPs that neither parent had. So you're looking at all these SNPs in 3 billion base pairs, 
and identifying slips. And most of them were present in either mother or father. But there are about 60 of them that either parent had reflecting cosmic ray strikes during the parent's lifetime prior to conception. That's about two to three each year in the parents, but spread over the entire genome of three billion these days. The important part of the genome, the genes coding for structural proteins and the genes that regulate them, are perhaps about 3% of the total. So mutations and infected enlargement are some subset that is far less than 0 0.07 SNPs each year or one new SNP every 14 years. But that's just fine in terms of accumulation. It means that most of the time is spent waiting for the next mutation. Uh, and once it occurs, uh, it doesn't disappear the way uh, most mutations do, but it gets driven to fixation. A doing theory like this requires that I test each of the components to see if they are really essential. And that's easy to do for the grazers. Okay? Suppose, what if the grazers had been hunted to extinction? Well, you know, our ancestors could continue eating the meat of large animals because there'd still be browsers and mixed feeders around. You know, the first hole would still cluster in the shade and benefit from the associative mating, sorry, mating. Cosmic rays would keep producing mutations. But there would no longer be a boom and bust in the meat supply. So, no hitchhiking traits either, such as very large. While there would have been mixed feeders along the rift to Damanasi Pass, most would not bunch up at water holes, so there's no easy hunting. So that's one process which might have powered the evolutionarily rapid rise in pre-human brain size. It fits with quite a number of facts that constrain anyone's theory for enlargement, uh, explaining why it started, why it stopped, why just humans and not apes in general, why the Rift Valley, why sharp edges were so important but didn't give rise to a more general toolkit for so long. So brains aside, what of this is of more general interest in evolutionary theory? Well, first of all, it does add to selective opportunity the feedback that makes it such a fast alternative to the usual selective survival path. I mean, basically, by amplifying alleles to fixation quickly, ones that would otherwise disappear by chance, because of low numbers, you can get a fairly steady uh, accumulation of shade-related traits, for example. But the other thing it adds to evolutionary theory is hitchhiking. Let's say any trait, say myopia, that concentrates in the boom's catchment zone is also enhanced. It's not just about bigger brains. It could also enhance the genes for uh, child care, for example, in the shade, the community child care, where you know one woman may nurse another's infant, uh, uh, and so forth, would tend to uh, to be in the shade as well. Uh, so this looks like it may provide a way into the um, uh, problem of this sort of community child care, uh, which is called eusocial behavior, uh, is very rare in animals. That is to say, uh, there is only about one other in the mammals, uh, one of the um, groundhogs, uh, that also has this. Uh, there are 18 examples, mostly in the insects, uh, doing this. It's originally studied in, in ants, for example. Uh, but that is possibly another place where this general uh, feedback loop theory uh, may prove applicable. I also think it's applicable to the um, 
common bed sore problem causing perhaps is a setup for increasing antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria. Uh, the whole process of filtering out because of the long, slow blood supply to a bed sore, the ones that survive that path without being knocked off by antibiotics or antibodies means that the resistant ones will accumulate in the, in the pus and with turning over in bed to relieve, uh, try to head off more of this, uh, you would then have released into the bloodstream, the blood supply comes back, pressure taken off. Uh, you would now have the uh, possibility of releasing into the general bloodstream uh, more antibiotic resistant bacteria than it had before. And so again, you get the uh, compounding of interest type uh, feedback loop. Well, we've just gone through the third lecture of the series. The next one is about our kind of language and now will lead us into our, sort of our kind of consciousness, our ability to look ahead, speculate, craft new plans. Thank you very much, and remember to tune in for the fourth and fifth lectures.